Good morning, world. Welcome to another episode of Zen Dependently Minded. If you are a new or returning listener, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you're interested in more content like this and podcasts in the future, stay tuned because it's only going to get better from here. Be a good friend, neighbor, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever, and share Zen Dependently Minded with everyone you know. And just be a good person because Zen Dependently Minded is the best combat sports podcast out there. So on this episode of Zen Dependently Minded, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. Uh, one thing is just some speculation on on my part of thinking about who, just talking about some potential matchups for Jorge Masvidal now that he's lost his first title shot against Kamaru Usman. Um, he lost at UFC 251 a couple weeks ago. Um, and I also wanted to talk about the upcoming fight card, which is pretty exciting fight card. It features, um, uh, Shogun Hua, I think, and Fabricio Verdum, they're fighting, I believe. Um, Gustafson's making his, no, uh, it's, it's Big Nog and Mauricio Hua, I don't know why I thought, yeah, Fabricio Verdum is fighting Alexander Gustafson in Gustafson's heavyweight debut. Um, and then also Kamzat, uh, Kamaev, I don't know how to say his name, he, he fought actually 10 days ago, and he's fighting again, because obviously didn't take, sustain any damage, so he's fit enough, and the, the doctors have cleared him to fight again, and, um, obviously the main event, uh, Robert Whitaker and Darren Till, probably two of the best non, uh, besides Paulo Costa and Israel Adesanya, of course, these are probably the two best middleweights, um, the middleweight division is starting to look a little more stacked and a little more promising, but I'll talk about all that towards the end. Uh, just starting off, so obviously Jorge Masvidal lost his first title shot against Kamaru Usman. He got completely dominated. He seemed like he got tired um, the, like the middle of the first round, so probably had a lot to do with training. I know he had been training, quote-unquote, for this Kamaru Usman title fight, um, but I know he wasn't working on his cardio that good. He wasn't in in the gym that much, um, he was just kind of doing a little bit of pad work, uh, helping some other fighters, I know he said that he wanted to, uh, not, not take time off, but not work too much, so he, uh, because he didn't want to get burned out, and then possibly have to step in for a title shot, do a whole camp, um, which we saw that didn't happen, he fought, came in on six days notice, which was pretty badass if you ask me, but, um, he just didn't want to burn himself out, so he wasn't training, um, two or three times a day, uh, he's maybe training once a day, um, a few times a week, maybe four or five times a week, it's, uh, don't take me, don't take my quoting, um, don't take it accurately, uh, that's, I'm just trying to remember what Jorge said, um, but yeah, he got dominated in that fight, Usman, um, took him down multiple times, uh, one judge actually gave Jorge the first round, which was weird, because, I mean, he landed, like, three leg kicks, and then he got taken down, landed some elbows on the bottom, but Kamaru controlled him that whole round, he took him down, um, a couple times, and then he just controlled the whole entire fight, like he always has, he's a really strong guy, uh, he's got really good cardio, he's big, so it's hard to slip past him, and he's got a good chin, he can stand up, um, obviously Jorge has the, the advantage, uh, standing up and boxing, standing and banging, but, that's not what Kamara did. Kamara held him against the cage. He stomped on his foot the whole time, and then he landed some body shots, and he took him down a bunch of times because Jorge got really tired um, and just didn't really look like he wanted to be there physically. Obviously, mentally, you won't, anybody wants to be there in a title shot um, in that kind of situation, but Jorge just got tired out, um, and he got dominated. Uh, it's what I said was going to happen, and it's what some people said was going to happen. I know the betting the betting odds showed Kamaro as the heavy favorite, but a lot of people I saw uh, were giving Jorge a fair shot, and I was not giving him any really any chance, especially coming off of a. I would have given him a chance if he got a, if he had like a full fight card um, or a full f training camp because he was able to throw everything into his shots for three rounds against Nate Diaz. So we know Jorge is not someone who doesn't have good cardio. He has great cardio, and that would have made all the difference. Uh, I would have given him a better chance, and I'm sure that betting odds would have too, but on a six days notice, I just didn't give him really any chance at all to beat Usman, and Usman just showed that he's able to neutralize 
um, and just yeah, just neutralize and kind of I wouldn't say dominate because he just really held him against the cage and um, it's not a bad thing, but it's not like he it's not, he didn't Khabib anybody that's for sure. Um, but it's a win. What especially title shot win? Um, I'm sure people will appreciate Kamar Usman after he's gone um, out of fighting the way people appreciate GSP now because a lot of people didn't appreciate GSP when he was fighting, and now they do. So uh, there's a lot of fights for Jorge Masvidal after this. Um, a big a big one that a lot of people have been talking about that he actually s turned down right away, um, he, or, or so he says, uh, is a fight with Colby Covington. Of course, the storylines there, the X's and O's are there. Uh, they used to be best friends, used to roommate together. Um, they, used to, they used to train together in American Top Team when Colby Covington was still with American Top Team, but he's not anymore. So that's there's a big storyline there because there's a lot of drama. They hate each other. They talk trash about each other all the time. Um, they've been throwing low blows at each other. Even uh, Jorge's manager is getting involved. He's been talking about exposing Colby Covington possibly. But this is... This is all stuff I, I don't really care about the exposing part. The, the drama, of course, is what makes the buildup for a fight really crazy and awesome. Like, every, uh, like, the, the I think the highest selling UFC fight of all time, um, pay-per-view wise, is Conor versus Khabib, I believe, because of that drama. I mean, people are going to watch Conor and people are going to watch Khabib no matter what, but the fact that there was so much blood between, like, uh, such a, a big feud between them and then all the history and then Connor getting arrested, throwing the dolly, all that stuff. That kind of stuff will will really make or break um, on whether or not a fight will sell or not. So there's a lot of drama there that would make a lot of money and the UFC could always play with that BMF title, even though Dana White said that's a one-time thing and I think it should be a one-time thing because it's not a real belt. Um, it made the fight with him and Nate Diaz kind of fun, but it's not a real belt, don't need to defend it. Just keep it at the house uh, and leave it at that. We don't need another one of those events again. It's kind of lame. So Jorge and Colby Covington is a fight that I would love to see. I think I would like to see that fight the most. Um, and then the next fight that I would love to see the most for Jorge is Leon Edwards. Because everyone remembers the three-piece in a soda line from Jorge. Um, Leon Edwards was talking smack to him right after he fought Darren Till, which was... It was like a double... It was like a, a double D-bag move because, one, it was in Leon Edwards' home country. He knows that he's invincible. He knows that he can probably get away with a lot of stuff. And then, yeah, it was kind of a triple D-bag move because he also had a bunch of his friends with him. So he's going to run up on someone um, with a bunch of friends. And then the third thing that just, like, made me lose any ounce of respect I had for him as a man was the fact that Jorge just got out of a fight with a really good guy. And Darren Till. He starched Darren Till and knocked him out, and it was a scary knockout. Um, uh, and that really set him on a collision course. Um, set him up to fight Ben Askren, and then he fought Nate Diaz, and then Kamar Usman. So that was just kind of like a, a stupid sleaze bag move for Leon Edwards to do. I've never been a fan of Leon Edwards. Um, even before that, he's not that exciting of a fighter. He hasn't gotten a finish since I was like two years old. Um, he doesn't have that cool of a personality. He tries too hard to trash talk. He tries to, he doesn't try to be cringy, but he really tries to talk trash. Um, he's kind of like Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades will go talk about how he's going to kill people, knock them out cold, and then he just goes out there and he sneaks by on the most boring decision fought. And I love wrestling, but the kind of fight that Curtis Blades had recently was whack. Um, every fight that Leon Edwards has been in has been whack, in my opinion. Um, it was nice to see him get destroyed by Kamar Usman. It's kind of funny that Leon Edwards thinks he deserves a title shot when, um, I mean, he's on a win streak. Cool, but so is everybody else in the welterweight division. Uh, Michael Chiesa is on a win streak also. So, there's, I would love to see Jorge Masvidal fight Leon Edwards because they have the beef, the drama, the storylines, the X's and O's, just like with the Covington fight. But it doesn't have as much steam because, you know, Colby and... Colby and or Jorge and Leon Edwards aren't ex best friends and all that stuff, uh, but there's still a lot of drama there. There's real beef and having real animosity and beef in a fight, it it helps. It helps and you can't you can't sit here and pretend that when two guys hate each other it doesn't make a fight better. 
um, than if they're best friends. So I'd love to see Jorge fight Leon Edwards and kind of shut Leon Edwards' mouth. Um, Leon Edwards is, he kind of fights like Kamara Usman, but he's worse in every facet of the game. So um, it would be cool to see Jorge starch him and shut his mouth so we can finally stop hearing him talk. Um, I really don't like him. I respect him as a fighter because he's a fighter. He steps in the cage, of course. But I'm not a fan, and I don't have to be a fan. <laughs> so I'm not going to pretend that I am. So I'd love to see Jorge knock him out and just kind of derail that hype train. Because his 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 only notable victory recently, or really ever, was against RDA. And RDA's been beat by everybody because I think RDA's past his prime, and he's not really too sure what weight class he wants to be in. Uh, he's been hopping around, which will do damage to your skills, your mindset, your mentality, your uh, your confidence. So, yeah, congratulations. You beat RDA. So did the, half the UFC. Um, and that's no that's no insult to RDA. RDA is a legend. He's a very tough guy. Really good fighter. But it's Leon Edwards doesn't deserve a title shot. There's quite a few people that I think deserve one in front of him. And number one is Gilbert Burns. He deserves a title shot for sure. And then the next up guy, I think, would be Colby Covington. He deserves his rematch, especially if he goes and beats Tyron Woodley. Like, like uh, I mean, I think Tyron Woodley doesn't want to fight Colby at the time Colby does, but that's whatever. It's typical well, UFC welterweight banter. They all claim that they're, they want to fight and then never actually goes through because neither of them sign or only one of them signs. It's whatever, but... I would think Gilbert Burns is next up for the title shot. Colby Covington or Jorge Masvidal, whoever can get a win first. Um, and then maybe Leon Edwards, if he can get a win over someone notable that isn't boring. If he can actually like put in effort and not try to put everyone to sleep with his fights. But uh, that rant is over. Uh, another fight that a lot of people uh, have been talking about of course, they're always going to talk about it just because of the star power of both guys. Um, and that's actually something I wanted to cover, but I'll kind of talk about it in a couple minutes. But, of course, Conor McGregor and Jorge Masvidal. Um, one thing I was thinking was that if, big, big, capital B-I-G, big if, if um, Kamara was to get beat by Jorge, this would be a perfect chance for Conor McGregor to be the first three-weight division champion because... Um, Connor's Connor's at his best. He shines at his best when he fights people who are boxers or stand-up guys. He's never been outboxed ever in his career, except for when he boxed one of the best boxers ever. But as far as MMA goes, he's never been outboxed before. Um, he's and he's faced some good strikers. He faced Max Holloway, of course, when Max was young. He fought Dustin Poirier, of course, when Dustin was in the wrong weight class. But he's fought. He's 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 never been knocked out. He's never been knocked down. He's only ever been stunned a couple times. Um, when he was fighting big guys like Nate Diaz, who hit harder because they're bigger, of course. Um, but this would be Connor's best chance because if Connor was to fight Kumar Usman, he would just get held against the cage, um, out grappled, out maneuvered, and out wrestled, and it'd be like Connor versus Khabib, but even worse because Kamara was a big guy, a big strong guy. But if Connor was to fight Jorge Masvidal, he has a big chance um, of beating Masvidal, out striking him. Or even knocking him out because we've seen Masvidal get dropped before, um, and that that's just a fight that everyone will always talk about. But as far as star power goes, it would probably be the one of the biggest, the highest selling pay per view fights of all time. But do not do not uh, hype up Jorge Masvidal so much. I saw so many people saying, "Oh, you know, Jorge Masvidal is on Conor McGregor's level, especially if he beats Kamar Usman." I'll, I'll tell you this right now, and if you go down the street to a store, just go to your Walmart, and you ask some random old lady who Conor McGregor is, she'll know who he is, she'll have heard his name, but if you ask him, if you ask her who Jorge Masvidal is, she's not going to know who that is. Conor McGregor is on another level of popularity. Him and Khabib are the two most popular UFC fighters in the entire world. Khabib, because he's got the whole entire Muslim fan base um, backing him. So he's got legit amount of fans and popularity, and then Connor is just known everywhere. He he just he transcended past the UFC. He has a clothing brand. He's got uh, he's got his whiskey. He crossed over to boxing. So Jorge Masvidal is not on the popularity level of Connor McGregor. Um, not named Connor, he's probably 
the most popular fighter in the UFC right now. So that's it. That's a good thing going for him. I'm not insulting Jorge. I'm just saying he's people need to chill out because he is not on the same level as Connor, and people should stop pretending, stop getting ahead of themselves. But that would be a fight that would be cool to see. Um, I would rather, I would much rather see Jorge fight Colby um, or Leon Edwards. Those two are the main two that I really want to see. And then I just want to see Connor come back and fight more and fight in the lightweight division. The lightweight division is where he belongs. It's where the best competition is. Um, I feel like he has unfinished business there. He only fought there uh, twice, losing one of them against Khabib, of course. Um, and then the kind of fourth fight that people have been talking about, I don't think will happen. It's probably least likely because Nate Diaz doesn't know how to uh, stay active these days or uh, just not throw a fit when he loses. Uh, obviously, Nate Diaz and Jorge, a rematch, because I don't understand why people say that the fight ended controversially last time they fought, the first time they fought, because Jorge was beating the crap out of Nate Diaz. I, I think he won 10-8 every single round except for the third. Uh, yeah, 10-8. I, I gave him a 10-8 every single round. Um, possibly the second one would be a 10-9, but... Nate Diaz was getting absolutely murdered, and he doesn't get many finishes um, in the later rounds. When he gets finishes, it's 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 a submission. He doesn't knock people out often, um, and I just didn't see him, after getting torn up so much, I just didn't see him doing anything against Jorge. If it would have went to decision, he would have acted like he was surprised that he lost because he always does that, him and Nate Diaz. Um and that cut over his eye was gnarly. Uh, his eyebrow was hanging off. Uh, a couple good left hooks to that eye, he probably would have lost his eyelid. Um, all of a sudden, everybody on MMA Twitter and Facebook and Instagram became doctors and surgeons. But come on, that guy's eye eyelid was hanging off. Um, so that wasn't a controversial loss to me. Um, yeah, we've seen worse cuts, but the doctor is there for a reason to protect the fighters. So um, it would be a fun fight if we were to see them rematch. But I think if they were to rematch uh, and Jorge got a full camp, of course, he'd be able to finish Nate Diaz probably inside two rounds or three rounds. Um, but we're probably never going to see that happen because Nate Diaz keeps retiring, throwing fits. So moving on from um, the 80 people Jorge Masvidal could fight, I want to go to uh, UFC Fight Night 174, which is going on in a couple days. A little sad about this fight um, because, well, for one, it was supposed to be my first UFC fight. I was going to go with my girlfriend to Ireland. It was going to be in Dublin. It was going to be our first time at a UFC event, first time in Dublin, first time in Ireland. Man, it was it would have been super awesome to, to watch. Um, and then another reason that I'm sad is that Robert Whitaker and Darren Till are two of my favorite fighters. So definitely they're in my top seven, top five favorite fighters. I really like both of them, and I'm just not sure who to pick in this fight, but I'll make my prediction towards the end. Um, yeah, this fight's going to be really great. Um, we were blessed to see this fight even happen. Uh, we weren't sure if Robert Whitaker was going to retire or not. Uh, there were some rumors going on with him. Um, you know, people are a little disrespectful. After a guy loses, he needs some space, and a lot of people are just making up rumors. I don't know where the rumors are coming from, but basically, long story short, Robert Whitaker came out and he did an interview a couple months ago and just said that he was burnt. He was starting to get burned out and he needed to take time away. He said he worked on communication with his team, um, not working too hard, not overworking, spending time with his family. Um, and I'm really happy for him. I'm really happy to see him back. Um, when he fought Israel Adesanya, I, going into that fight, I thought I considered Robert Whitaker to be the greatest, um, tied with it, tied with, uh, Tied with Anderson Silva, I considered him to be the greatest striker in UFC history. And then we saw Israel Adesanya completely dismantle him, so I think Izzy takes that spot. Um, but he's one of the best strikers, one of the most feared strikers in UFC history. And I love that guy to death, and it was sad to see him lose, but I, I'm a bigger Izzy fan. So uh, it's whatever, but Darren Till is a, is a young guy. I think he's only 25 or 26. He was a little rushed into that title shot, got destroyed by Tyron Woodley, um, then he got knocked out by Masvidal, left for a little bit, and moved up weights, uh, weight classes. And I'm really happy to see him at middleweight because he's a big guy. I don't know how he was able to make welterweight. He's so tall, so lanky. He's got muscles. He's got power. 
He's got endurance and pace. And it's going to be interesting to see if Robert Whitaker can handle that that kind of um, reach disadvantage. But I'm not, I don't think he's going to struggle with it too much. Uh, it's going to be one of his tougher challenges. But Robert Whitaker fought. He fought Jacare Souza. He fought Brad Tavares. He fought a lot of guys that are longer than him. And he used to be a lightweight. So, or he used to be a welterweight. So he's not the biggest middleweight for sure. Um, this is going to be a really interesting fight, and I'm super excited, but also a little scared because I love both guys, and I don't want to see either guy lose. Um, but as far as my prediction goes for this, I, I really truly think um, it's going to go the distance. I don't think either guy is going to get finished. Uh, there hasn't been as many finishes in these crowdless fights anyways, but I just think Darren Till fought very defensively in a smart way because he'd come off two losses two finishes uh, when he fought Kelvin Gastelum he looked really good his distance control uh, his distance management was really good um, we saw him doing a lot of leg kicks <clears throat> just keeping keeping Kelvin Gastelum away from him because Kelvin hits really hard he hits like a truck uh, he can put anybody out in the middleweight division really if we're being honest um, but I just I just think it looks like Darren Till is possibly too careful um, he's been in his head lately uh, he's always been in his own head. Um, he's a young guy, but he's and he's a great fighter. But he's probably gonna get in his own head, and he's just gonna never. He's not gonna know when to pull the trigger, and it's not gonna do well. It's that just that kind of style and that kind of game plan does not go well against someone like Robert Whitaker, who is a seasoned vet. He's a young guy too. I think he's only thirty years old or twenty nine years old, but he's a guy who's gonna keep coming forward. He's gonna hit you with leg kicks, body kicks, hooks to the body hooks to the face he's just going to hit you with every possible strike you could think of and if you're and if Darren Till is going to be if Darren Till is going to kind of not know when to pull the trigger it's not going to go well for him and I just think Robert Whitaker being more focused and not as burned out uh taking he's taking time off he's he said he didn't lose any love for the game he got that hunger back spent time with his family he, he's got his head straight and I just think focused Robert Whitaker can be anybody on any given day um so I'm going to take Robert Whitaker here I'm going to actually give him a unanimous decision victory over Darren Till and just going over a couple uh really one more yeah a couple more fights on this fight card so the co-main um Mauricio Hua and Big Nog they're fighting I believe this is a trilogy fight um they kind of had to finish this trilogy off, but I wish it would have happened earlier um, because these guys, these two guys are old. Um, Big Nog is 44 years old. Um, Mauricio Hua is 38. Um, you know, they're out of their primes, but it's going to it's gonna be cool. It's going to be a little bittersweet. We're probably going to see a retirement from either one or both of these guys after they, um, whatever the outcome is. <clears throat> it, it'd be cool to see it end on a sweet... Uh, classy kind of sportsmanship uh sports like um you know kind of honorable end just see them see them uh finish this rubber match with honor and respect for each other and then just ride off into the sunset uh well whoever loses won't be able to do that but you get my point um so we'll see what happens there and just a lot of respect and hats off to those guys for some great careers and both of them and then coming down to another fight I wanted to talk about the last one I really wanted to brush on was Fabricio Verdum and Alexander Gustafson. So Gus Gus is one of those guys with uh, a lot of people say that he's probably the greatest greatest light heavyweight fighter um, to never win a belt or one of the greatest fighters to never win a belt. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people say that if John Jones didn't exist or if he he fought earlier or later, uh, same with DC, Gustafson would be champ. And this is true. He is one of the best fighters to never win the belt win a belt if if you can narrow it down to one guy he would definitely be up there in the top three um obviously he lost he got submitted by um anthony smith his last fight um he, he did he just looked off there he looked like he just didn't look like he wanted to be there he looked like someone who was a little burned out and he retired for a little bit and now he's back and he's up a heavyweight and i think that's a great fit for him because he's fast he's really fast he's definitely gonna be faster than 42 year old for Brucey over doom so this can be something interesting um we know alex alexander has been off for a little bit um 
but his speed is probably going to still be there, and it's going to be something that is going to play heavily to his favor when fighting Fabricio Verdun. But Fabricio Verdun, if he's able to take Gus down, which I'm not sure if he'll be able to, probably doesn't have the enough explosion to do it. Plus, Gus has one of the best takedown defenses in the UFC. If he manages to take him down, Gus will be in big trouble. So Gus is going to have to be careful, not get to uh, not be gunslinging and trying to swing uh, every single shot. He needs to not make every single shot uh, a fight-ending shot. Um, he just needs to take his time, tire out Fabrice Overdoom, use his speed, and just finish him. Finish him with a head kick or knee to the body, something. Um, I do see a finish coming, though, and I do think it's going to be Alex. I think Gus is going to win, but he just needs to be he needs to be careful, not blow his load too early, and then not get taken down. Um and if he is taken down, just watch out for the, watch out for those crazy ground and pound strikes, and watch out for the submissions for sure. But that's going to end this episode of the podcast. I know it was a little bit of a long one, but it's been a while, and there's a lot to talk about, and there's more to talk about. Uh, next week, I'm going to go over UFC 252, which features the rubber match, the third match, and the ending of the trilogy, and probably the ending of both guys' careers. Uh, the heavyweight championship is on the line between Stipe Miocic and Daniel Cormier. And then a little bit more down the line, I'm going to talk about the announced or not announced, not really sure, uh, fight between Paulo Costa and Israel Adesanya. So stay tuned and thank you for listening.